Good evening. My name is Melanie McGacken from the Family Support Center of New Jersey. Joining us tonight also are my coworkers Laura Kay and Michelle Tyler. I hope everyone is joining us from the comforts of their home. Please note, once we start the webinar, you will have the opportunity to ask questions by clicking the dialog box on the right-hand corner of your screen. We will try to get to as many questions as time allows. I would like to welcome you to the last session of a series of webinars that was provided by attorney Hillary Freeman. Hillary is deeply committed to her work representing people with disabilities and their families. As the sister of a man with autism, she is able to combine her personal experience with her legal training to help families advocate for services and supports. She has experience representing clients in special education and Section 504 issues higher education issues including accommodations on high stakes testing and graduate school admission tests, guardianship matters, estate planning, and adult services. At this time, I would like to introduce attorney Hillary Freeman who will be leading this evening's presentation, the topic titled Addressing Social and Emotional Development in the IEP. Okay, Hillary, can do you hear me? control of the screen? Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I do want to uh, thank everybody, especially the Family Support Network, for allowing me the opportunity to do these webinars. Um, they, I think they have been a success, and I also, I just, you, the supports that you all give are just fantastic, and I wanted to thank you for that. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about addressing social and emotional development through the IEP. Um, you, Melanie already gave you a little bit of my background. Um, I have a brother with autism, and um, I got into this field because I was advocating for him throughout his lifespan. He currently lives in a group home. Um, he's autistic and very, very low functioning. Um, and uh, we taught, we were advocating for him through, for academics, for social skills, emotional development, because we're still working on his behaviors, but uh, that changes on a daily basis. Um, so I got involved that way, and now I, I continue to advocate for people with disabilities across their lifespan. Um, I opened up offices in Princeton and Freehold, New Jersey, and um, anytime you have any questions, you can feel free to contact me through my website at uh, freemanlawoffices.com. You can see that in the upper right-hand corner. You can call me or email me at Hillary, H-I-L-L-A-R-Y, at freemanlawoffices.com. Um, okay, so the, so the reason that we chose to talk about this topic is because it seems to be a pretty uh, pressing issue with regard to students with disabilities. Um, the, the purpose of education is to teach students in general, not just for um, students with disabilities, but it's to teach students to be as successful as possible in life, in their post-secondary environment, in their job, in their career, in job or career, in college, and become independent um, in in throughout their life. So, th so throughout their career, um, their educational career, the schools are supposed to be teaching students. To the skills necessary to become as independent as possible and successful in life. Um, the problem that we often see in, through the school districts is that they, they're, they're so focused on academics that they forget about the social and emotional development. Um, I hear a lot of parents who are saying, you know, my student can't talk or they're very, my, my student, my child can't talk or um, they uh, are, they are, are, I'm seeing a lot of behaviors, or I can't get my child to go to school, they're depressed, um, and maybe the school will come back and say, well, their grades are fine, so they're, we're not, so it's not an issue, um, and maybe go to, the, and recommend that you go to counseling or medicate your child. Um, if they're, if you're having trouble getting your child to school, the school district might come back and say, you know, that, that's not our problem, get them to school or we'll file truancy charges against you. 
Um, but it's not necessarily true. Um, they, it is their problem. It's also your problem. It's everybody's problem because it's everybody as it's everybody's job to teach your teach the students um, all of these skills so they can become independent. Okay. Um, so those are just some examples, and I'll get into more excuses later when uh, what districts say and not not I don't want to say how to get around it, but really I you know everybody has a good heart and good interest like, and, and wanting to teach your uh, your children the skills but you know because with funding shortfalls and et cetera, they don't necessarily know how the best ways of implementing that pro type of program so tonight I'm going to compare talk about regu regular education versus special education as it relates to um, again social and emotional development going to talk about eligibility for special education and uh, this is all is geared towards social and emotional development the components of an IEP I'm going to give you an example and walk you through the example and I'll take questions definitely at the end and probably um, at different points throughout okay so that's the agenda for tonight um, the initially I'm going to talk about the core curriculum content standards and these standards were developed as part of a regular education initiative um, in 1996, I believe it was, to develop standards, uniform standards, as to what students need to be successful in their careers and daily lives. Um, the reason that I'm mentioning this is because students, when they, when they, typical students and special ed students are supposed to be learning skills geared around these content areas, okay? Um, all teachers are supposed, are theoretically supposed to be teaching skills according to these standards to make sure everybody's learning the same skills and same areas um, because this is what a, a committee determined was necessary for the students to be successful um, in their careers and daily lives. So you have the core curriculum content standards and then what about the students with disabilities? Um, this, the special, for the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act is the law that governs special education and that was designed also to ensure that students, um, that all children with disabilities have available to them a free and appropriate public education that emphasizes special education and related services to meet, designed to meet their unique needs and again to prepare them for, to, for, for further education, employment and independent living. So you see, you might see the commonality here in that everybody's supposed to be learning the skills to be independent um, and uh, you know and be successful in their post-secondary environment in their jobs and in their careers and in life. Um, but for students with special special needs, um, they get their own individualized curriculum to um, to, to learn those same the same skills. Okay, um, in order to be considered to be, in order to be eligible for special education and related services under the IDEA, the student um, has to have a disability that adversely impacts their ability to learn in the regular education environment. Um, so it, you, you would look to, well, what is the student supposed to be learning in the regular education environment? And is your child having difficulty learning those skills? Um, if so, is it because of their disability? Um, and is their disability impacting their ability to learn those skills? Okay, so again, we're talking about you have the general education curriculum, which is all, all centered around teaching your children skills to be successful in the post-secondary environment, meaning past high school. And then uh, um, you have the IDEA, which gives, which teaches, which says school districts, if you have to give the child with special needs an individualized curriculum so they can still learn the same skills so they too can be successful in the post-secondary environment. Um, so what skills do you, does your child need to be independent um, and to be successful? Well, they often need good social skills. Uh, they need to learn how to communicate. Um, which is obviously extremely important. They need to learn how to initiate conversations, respond to conversations, take turns. Um, they need to learn appropriate behaviors. Um, some of you who may have heard me speak, I talk about 
you know, my brother might go into a mall and um, if he wants something and I say no, he might jump up and down. Well, one might say that that's inappropriate behavior. Um, so that so an appropriate behavior is is key to being successful. You can't go into the workplace and when your boss says no, um, jump up and down. I've tried it many times; it's never worked. Uh, so I strongly would encourage you not to do that either. Um, so that, but again, you need appropriate behaviors, uh, emotions. Um, how does that play into the ch a child's uh, curriculum? If a child is depressed, they might withdraw themselves. They might not be as motivated as they normally would be um, to learn the skills necessary to be independent as possible. Um, they might need, they're, if they're depressed, they might not feel comfortable, or if they have low self-esteem, they might not feel comfortable um, interacting with their peers. Um, they might be intimidated. They, they might cry. They, they, again, it goes to withdrawal, but not always. Um, their emotions might lead to not doing homework and giving up. Um, so it, it can certainly adversely impact or negatively impact the child's education. Um, this is how they would be eligible for special education services. Okay? Um, so in determining eligibility for these services, again, you go to, does the student have a disability? So for, I'm going to talk about different disabilities and then talk about how it might interfere. I'll, I'll repeat a little bit of what I just said, but go into it in more depth. Does a student have a disability? Um, if they have autism, they might, uh, they're going to most likely have difficulty interacting. They might have difficulty speaking. Um, but that alone is not enough. Um, they might, they have to, that disability has to interfere with their ability to make progress in a particular area. Uh, so they can't do, so if, if depending on what the area is, that's, it, the disability would, might, may or may not interfere with it. It might not interfere with every area. It might interfere with some areas. But regardless, those are the areas that a certain committee determined were necessary for the child to make progress or become as independent as possible. Um, so it doesn't have to be in their entire educational program. It, ha it, it can be in any area that the school district um, or, the, or the committee determined was an important area to teach in the school's system. Um, so a student might be getting really high grades um, in math and in reading, but they are not interacting in, this, in, the, in group work, group meetings. Um, you learn a lot of skills in those team meetings or group assignments. You learn to initiate conversation. You, need to, you learn to respond to conversation. You, need, you learn maybe perhaps to take turns, analyze ideas, express ideas. Um, and, you know, just com completing the assignments themselves. So if a child has a disability that limits their ability to perform these skills, it will interfere with their, his or her ability to progress in that area, uh, even though it's, they, might not be in, be, they might not be graded in that particular assignment. Um, then you go into the next question or the last question in, in this legal analysis, does the student require special education and related services to learn these skills? Well, can they learn in the regular education environment, or do they need that extra instruction? Um, a student with autism might need a lot of repetition, okay? Or they might, you know, they might need to learn, have a more of a breakdown. A student with any disability might need to learn to break down the skills more so than a regular education student might need, in which case, they, they would be eligible for special education and related services because they need, those, they need that, that individual curriculum in order to learn those skills. Um, a student with dyslexia might have difficulty with pragmatics, um, expressive language, et cetera, but they might learn it some differently. Even though it interferes with their ability to make progress, maybe it interferes with their social skills, they might learn differently than a student with autism and also learn differently than a student with a regular education student. So they would require the special education geared towards their unique needs. Um, any questions so far about this? 
Hillary, uh, there's no questions pertaining to this topic so far. Fantastic. Okay, I just want to make sure everybody understands. Um, all right, so in determining whether ch your child is eligible for special education, and any this applies to any services that go into the IEP that you are looking for in the IEP, your child is evaluated, okay? They're required to be evaluated, every, their initial evaluation, um, to determine whether they have a disability, whether it impacts their ability to learn, and whether they require special education and related services to make progress or benefit from their education. Um, they require that, that initial evaluation, and then after that, the law requires that, they're re that they be evaluated every three years at a minimum. If it's determined that they need evaluations more often or more frequently than every three years, certain, it, there's nothing that uh, precludes the team from doing that. Um, so what evaluations would be appropriate to determine a student's, um, whether a student requires certain supports socially, emotionally, or behaviorally? Um, aside from the typical evaluations, the educational evaluation, a psychological evaluation, perhaps a social assessment, for, you, you might ask the team to do a speech and language evaluation. Um, but you're not just uh, looking at, pragma uh, excuse me, at articulation here, you're looking at pragmatics, which are recognizing social cues, um, you're, so, so, and, you're, and you're analyzing perhaps um, turn-taking, other social skills. You might ask for a psychiatric evaluation. The district has to pay for it, okay? Uh, and the psychiatric evaluation can determine if your child has an emotional um, issue or deficit that impacts their ability to learn. Are they depressed? Are they withdrawn? Are they, if they're involved in drugs, okay, drugs isn't, and they're doing poorly in school, you, I, in my view, you don't just look at it, with the, you don't blame that the student is doing, you don't blame the fact that the student is doing poorly in school on drugs. I would take it a step further and say, well, what caused them to get involved in those drugs? Um, are they, do they have a low self-esteem? Are they very depressed that they're trying to escape? Are they just trying to be cool? I mean, the, the evaluations could look at that. Okay, you might look for um, a, a, what else, an occupational therapy evaluation for life skills, but that doesn't really go towards social and emotional functioning. You can look to a functional behavior assessment. Uh, you can deter to determine um, if the child is having behaviors that impact their ability to learn, why, what's causing those behaviors. Um, and what is needed to alleviate those or remediate those behaviors. So those, these are the types of evaluations that might be appropriate um, to assess whether your child needs these extra services in their IEP. You can get an augmentative communication evaluation. Um, and that an augmentative communication evaluation, it might be if the student is having difficulty communicating and then maybe as a result of their difficulty expressing themselves, they might need an augmentative communication device to assist them with expressing their ideas. And this could be maybe a GoTalk, an iPad, um, an iTouch, and name another device with an I in front of it. Or you could, there's the Dynavox. There are a bunch of different um, devices that can help a child express their ideas. So that might be another evaluation that would be appropriate. Um, so you look to the evaluations. If you disagree with the results of the evaluations, you're entitled to an independent evaluation at the district's expense, and that would be done by somebody who is who works outside of the school district. Um, and the process would be that the the parents would request an independent evaluation. The district could give you and should give you a list of different um, people who could administer those independent evaluations, but you're not limited to that list. Uh, that's a pretty key point. You're not limited to the list that the district gives you in, um, in when you're requesting an independent evaluation. The law says that you just have to get your child evaluated by somebody who is um, qualified to administer that evaluation. So if you just, again, if you disagree with the results of the district's evaluations, then you're entitled to an independent evaluation at the district's expense. Uh, something that you might want to consider is 
in, when, with evaluations is if your child is having a lot of difficulties in the home or community environments, but the school is saying they're not having the same difficulty in the school environment, you could ask for them to come to the home, them being school district people, um, to come to the home and observe your child in the home as part of the evaluation. Um, because that might help you get additional services in the home or the community later on. Um, so that's a really long explanation of evaluations. Um, so once, if a child is determined to be eligible for an IEP, um, meaning that they've, they have a disability, it impacts their ability to learn in any of the areas determined to be necessary as part of the regular education curriculum, um, if, they, if they're having difficulty learning in those areas and they require specially designed instruction, they'd be eligible for an IEP. Uh, then you look to the, what, what happens in an IEP, what makes up the IEP. Um, in, in making up the IEP, you want to look to, well, what are the child's needs? Okay, and I'll get into that more specifically in a few minutes. Um, what supports does the student require to benefit from their regular education curriculum? Okay, and so, what, so often in, in cases with students with developmental disabilities or learning disabilities or with a mental illness, they might require additional supports to, like I said before, break down the steps um, to, so they can make progress towards their core curriculum content standards. And I know these are, this is very wordy, okay, but it's not as, it's pretty, it's, it's not that complicated, okay. You have the general, the, the baseline, um, the core curriculum content standards, and then, uh, well, why isn't your child able to learn these skills? And then it, you say, well, what does my child need to learn these skills? Um, and that's what the, that's the, those are the supports that your your child might be entitled to through the IEP. And then you look to well, where can these services be provided to enable the child to make progress um, towards these goals? Sometimes a regular education environment will be appropriate. Maybe the student will just needed some extra assistance outside of the classroom, or maybe they can get an aid inside of the classroom. But sometimes they're, you know, they, it might be too distracting, or for, they might be embarrassed by the, getting the extra assistance in the regular education class, or maybe they need um, a different type of methodology to learn the same skills. And then they would go to a more restrictive setting, such as a, maybe an inclusion, an inclusion class, a resource room, um, an out-of-district day program or a residential program. Maybe the child will be able to get services in the home. It's specific instruction in the home to teach the student the same skills. Um, these, it, you look to, there's no limit on where the services can be provided. Um, they can be provided in a camp setting. You, you, they can be provided in the home, in the mall. It really just depends on what you're trying to teach the student and what does it take to teach for that student to make progress. Okay, um, so now you're looking to developing the IEP. Um, you want to look. You want to consider where are the strengths of the child. What can they do? What um, what do they have? You want to look at the weaknesses too, because um, this is what do they? Can they initiate a conversation? Can they respond? Um, do they run all around or do they have attention difficulties or are they able to um, stay in one place and focus? Um, are they, do they do better in a one-on-one -on -one setting or in a small group setting versus a, you know, a pretty large class or a regular education class? class? Um, the parents typically know their child the best, so obviously the parents' concerns are extremely important in, de in developing the IEP. Um, then you look to the results of the evaluations, which I talked about before. The academic, developmental, and functional needs of the child. This functional is, and developmental, but more so functional, these are, this is where the law says Yes, school districts, you have an obligation to teach the student more than math and science, social studies, and reading. Okay, you you have the schools. You have an obligation to teach the student many different areas, whatever that needs 
they need to be independent as possible in all the different settings, okay, when they graduate. Um, so yes, the law does actually address that. It's more than just about the grades, okay? Um, the, you look at behavioral inter interventions, because if a child is having difficulty learning because of their behaviors, um, then it, maybe their behaviors are impacting their ability to learn because maybe they're not concentrating on the, uh, the, on the task at hand. Maybe they're lo looking at the pretty artwork on the wall. Maybe they're getting really upset about something. Anytime, maybe the, the teacher um, says, you know, changes activities very quickly and a student who has difficulty with transitions might get really upset. So as part of the IEP, you look to, well, how can we minimize those behaviors so it doesn't interfere with the child's progress in their curriculum. Um, you look to the communication needs of the student. Uh, do, they, do they speak English? Do they, if, if they're hearing impaired, do they need, a cert, do they need um, an interpreter? Do they need somebody to, like, do they need to learn how to sign? Um, do they need, what kind of communication device do they need? Have you looked at the augmentative communication assessment? Um, do they have the skills to manipulate the augmentative communication um, device? And then assistive technology devices. What does the student need, again, so that to minimize the impact of their disability on their progress toward, in the curriculum, such as maybe a slanted desk, um, yeah, um, that's a, a enlarged print, um, things like that. So I'm just giving some examples. A tape recorder, a tape recorder um, to to copy the notes or to tape record the notes for the student who has difficulty with note taking. Um, so these are some factors that you should consider when developing the IEP. Um, I said before, you know, that functional is a very big deal. Um, this is what, and the law says that. Functional is defined as routine activities of everyday living. Um, so that involves appropriate behaviors, um, appropriate, uh, um, appropriate behaviors, social skills, and uh, things like that. Um, so that's the definition of functional. So I mentioned before considerations of the, in developing the IEP. Now you look into components of an IEP. Um, the first, the first part, which in my view is an extremely, extremely important part of the IEP, maybe it might be the most important part of the IEP, that's where you talk about the statement of the child's present levels of academic achievement and functional performance, okay? You want to look to, you want to be extremely, extremely specific in this section because this is the baseline of the IEP, this is why your child has an IEP. They, this is why they require special instruction to benefit from their education. So you can talk, you can, in this area, you can certainly include the evaluation results um, through and how the student does in math, reading, science, social studies, um, if they can add and subtract, if they can, if, are they single step problems or multi step problems. Um, if they can write their alphabet, if they can count to 20 but not 30, you want to include that part in here. You want to include if they're doing well in certain classes or doing, doing poorly in certain classes. But more importantly, and what's often left out in, of this section is the functional performance. Um, you really want to talk about what can the child, your child do and what do they need, they still struggle with. So, for social skills, I, I keep on going back to a simple example, which is initiating a conversation. Um, can they initiate a conversation? Do they, do they initiate it with peers and with adults, just with peers or just with adults? Um, do they know how to take turns or do they talk about, talk constantly, kind of like what I'm doing now? Do, can they change subjects? Um, or do they talk about only what they're interested in talking about? So these are certain um, parts that you can actually put in the present levels of academic and achievement and functional performance. In fact, you really should put that in there. Otherwise, there's a chance that people are going to not know about it and that area might never be addressed. So you really should be specific here. Um, I said before, this is the baseline of the IEP. This is where you write what your child can do, what they can't do, 
um, what they need assistance with, might, what, they, if they need prompting in certain areas, you should note that they need, they need prompting. Um, because not only will it help with teachers understanding your child's needs or profile, it will also help you measure progress from year to year. So if your child is, doing, is able to do the same things that they could do five years ago, and they're still struggling in the same areas that they were struggling with five years ago, you know you have to change something. Um, hopefully you're not waiting five years to do that, but you know you get, you get the idea. Um, then you go to number two, a statement of measurable annual goals, including academic and functional goals designed to meet the child's needs um, that result in the child's disability to enable them to make progress. So you want to talk about, like I, I mentioned before, what do they need to, to benefit from their regular education curriculum? Okay, what skills do they need? What instruction do they need? Um, and then you want to make sure that the, measure, the goals are measurable. They're not anecdotal. Okay? A, a goal such as the student will learn to act in a socially appropriate manner is not measurable. Okay? You might want to talk, you might want to specify what environment you're talking, where, what environment your child will learn um, the skills. So if they're going to act in a socially appropriate manner in the classroom, that, or the, that might be different from the library or the cafeteria or the hallway or even the mall. Okay? So you want to talk about, well, you want to make goals, design, write goals designed around your child's unique needs. Okay, not their disability, their unique needs. Um, so, and more goals related to um, meeting each of the goals around all of the educational needs, not just functional performance, and then a description of how the child's progress, how the child's uh, can progress towards meeting the annual goals, how will it be measured and how will it be reported. If your child will or the student will learn to initiate a conversation um, eight out of ten times, it sh data should be collected or you should understand how are they measuring eight out of ten times, under what circumstances are they collecting data. Okay, not only when they can do it, they should be collecting data as how many when they're actually attempting to do it and when it's successful and when it's not successful. Okay, so these are, this, these are the goals. They need to be measurable and they need to be reported accurately so you can determine whether they are, um, your child is making progress okay, and learning the skills. Okay, um, any questions so far? Hillary, we actually have quite a few questions coming in. Um, the first one I'm going to give you is that does the school district have to address the social and emotional needs in the 504? Yes, they do. They have to address the social and emotional needs in all the different areas. Um, the standards are a little bit different in the 504 plan. Um, the 504 plan is considered to be an accommodation plan. And so you're getting accommodations to help the child make progress. Um, you're not getting speci specially designed instruction, um, or that's what the law says. Um, practically speaking, you could certainly include certain specially designed instruction in the 504 plan, but the district is not required to include that in there. Okay, our next question is, what specific supports are there that you might recommend to assist with social and emotional development? I have a high-functioning son with Asperger's. He's mainstreamed with a one-on-one -on -one para. Um, what specific supports for a student with Asperger's? Some might include, and you're not limited to this. I have to be a lawyer and say include, but not limited to. Um, you might get, if your child is having difficulty initiating conversation in a mall or um, in, a, in a large group, you might get actual instruction um, in that environment. So you might, you might ask for an extended school day program or an extended school year program where you could get instruction as in that particular environment, so in camp. Um, in the mall, they, that your child might need to learn math, um, may, maybe 
need to learn to make a purchase on their own. Um, that includes social skills, emotional skills, and academic skills. And they so it might you might ask for an extended school day program either when your child is younger or as part of their transition plan at 14 or 16, um, where an aide or a job coach takes them out into the community and helps them, you know, go into a store, make a purchase, um, ask for change, and count the change. Um, and so that will involve expressing themselves, expressing wants and desires, as well as um, in incorporating academics into that environment, and that's and uh, that's a life skill. That would be another area. Um, maybe emotional support, uh, maybe group counseling or individual counseling to make sure that the student is expressing their ideas or expressing if they have anxiety about a certain situation. Talk about how to deal with it, and then maybe you can help get the instruction in the environment to enable the child to generalize their skills across environments. So that would be some examples, um, but I'm certainly willing to talk to you afterwards about it if you want to email me or call me. Um, Hillary, we have one more question. Uh, sure, we actually have quite a few. So um, whenever you're ready, just let me know during your presentation. Um, the next question is actually going to be, <laughs> I'm sorry, the next question is actually going to be two-part question. Um, what is a functional behavior analysis and can it be requested? Also, can a parent require a behavior intervention plan to help with school behavior problems and structure interventions? A functional behavior anal behavioral analysis or assessment, there, it's functional behavior assessment, that can be used interchangeably, um, is an assessment designed to assess the child's what the child, why the child is engaging in the behavior, um, the function of the behavior. So I told you before that uh, my brother sometimes jumps up and down, and what he could be doing that for various reasons. One, because he's anxious. Um, the main reason is always, actually, that because I've said no to something. Um, so he might jump up and down because he thinks that it's going to get him what he wants. Um, so a functional behavior assessment or is identifying what is the function of the behavior, what happens right before the behavior occurs. Um, in this case, I, would, I said no. What is the actual behavior? He jumped up and down. And what is the consequence? Sometimes I'll give in, um, and which point that's not really the greatest type of plan um, because then in the future he'll continue, he'll think that by jumping up and down, he'll get what he'll get. He will get what he wants, and so I have to change that um, and say, "Well, we've identified that he does that to get what he wants. Well, I have to change my behavior so he changes his behavior. So now, if he jumps up and down, I will try, do my best to ignore him. At which point, he'll realize that jumping up and down is no longer going to get him what he wants. He's going to have to try a new approach." And when he tries a new approach that's more socially appropriate, like saying, I want whatever, uh, if I get into that, then hopefully it will be reshaping his behavior so he can learn, so he can act in a socially appropriate way. So you can certainly ask for a functional behavioral analysis. If the district says no, then you can ask for an independent evaluation. Um, there's a new law about, the, there, there's a clarification about the roles of independent evaluations now in the district. I can't go into it now, but there's an article about it on my website. So, um, so but that clarifies the independent evaluation. So you ask for a functional behavioral analysis. If they say yes, they do it, then the next step is to do a behavior intervention plan. Um, if the team says no, it would be because they would likely say no because they, they would say that the student does not, their behaviors don't interfere with their progress. And you could say, well, it might, they might be doing well getting high grades, but it's interfering with something else. And, usually, and you can list a core curriculum content standard if you want to use an example of how it's interfering. Um, and those, can be, those are listed on the Department of Education's website um, or in the IEP. So that's, um, that would be a way of asking for a behavior intervention plan. Parents can't require anything. Um, they can ask for it if the district says no. They can challenge the district's re, uh, response by filing a petition for mediation and due process. 
which is not as complicated as it sounds, but um, I'll, I'll get into that at another time. Okay, so um, I hope that helped. And I'm moving on to um, the, the last part of the, this, which is the statement of special education and related services. This goes to what service, again, before I was talking about the components of the IEP, we've identified the present levels of academic and functional performance, okay, what the student's um, strengths and weaknesses are. Then we've identified, well, are those services, how are the service, those disabilities or issues interfering with your child's education, okay? Where do they need to focus? What do their goals need to be? And then now, what special education and related services does your child need to achieve those goals, okay? And if, so something that I'd like to point out is if a goal is, in, is outside of the school environment, the school district still has to provide the special education to teach the child to advance appropriately towards the goal outside of the school environment. They can't just name a goal and say, all right, well, now you focus on that, unless you agree to it, of course. Um, they have to actually provide the instruction outside of that environment. Um, that can be done through an extended school day program or the transition plan um, as the child gets older. Um, so that's that's the statement of special education and related services. You you might also your child might need speech and language. They might need um, a sign language interpreter. They might need an augmentative communication device. They might need a social skills group. Um, they might need instruction in the environment where the skill is going to be used. Like I said before, camp. Okay, you don't. If your child needs to learn to interact with peers, you might get instruction. Your, your child might need instruction on re, in recess or in the cafeteria or in camp or in um, in the mall. So those are. Um, that would be under the statement of special education and related services. They might need counseling. Okay, um, I have a case now where the student it, um, was having truancy issues, and I say truancy loosely. Um, they, um, he is he is having school refusal issues really, and that's because he's really depressed um, and he has other emotional issues. Well. The school, up until he dropped out, not he didn't officially drop out, but he, until he stopped going, um, they were giving him counseling once a week for 20 minutes. Um, that's not enough. That's not enough to address the student's emotional concerns. First, it takes time to get to the, the um, therapy session and get settle in, and then by the time they settle in, it's probably they're probably leaving. Um, meanwhile, tons of things can happen during the week that the student might not be able to express in their therapy session. So 20 minutes isn't enough. Um, if that's all they can provide so they don't miss a lot of classroom time, then maybe they should get therapy outside of school, either through your, the parents, insurance companies, or perhaps the school district if determined necessary. Um, maybe a special education program in or out of district. Okay, um, they might, so counseling might be an appropriate area to address, um, I'm, 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 excuse me, an appropriate related service. And then these are all the skills, this, I, going back to C, to be educated and participate with other students, you want to get the instruction necessary so the child can hopefully get to a mainstream setting at some point in their curriculum uh, or their educational career. That's ultimately the goal. Um, so for them to be educated in the least restrictive environment with typically developing peers. Is it always appropriate for the student to learn in that environment? No. Um, if the only reason they're, in, they're in that environment is to have mentors and then take it a step further, they don't interact with those mentors because they have different interests, it might not be appropriate for this child to be in a regular education environment. Uh, students with Asperger's often talk about diff very different things from regular education students. Um, they might like to talk about computers or robots or planes or trains or automobiles um, or any, you know, whatever they're particularly interested in. Um, and the regular education student might look at them and say, well, we're not interested in that, you're weird, and then pick on them. Well, that's an issue. That could become an issue. So 
you really want to look at, well, what is the child trying to achieve, and will that environment help them achieve that? Uh, so I'm going to go through an example, because I think it really illustrates my this whole presentation. Um, and that is, here's a core curriculum content standard. Um, collaborate, the theme is collaboration, teamwork, and leadership, OK? The, it says the standard was, by the end of grade four, the students will practice collaborative skills in groups and explain how these skills assist in completing tasks in different settings, at home, in school, and during play. OK, so it's collaboration. This is a social skill. OK, then it's also analysis and expressive language. If your child is having difficulty achieving this goal because or the standard because they have difficulty learning social skills from the get-go, then they might need to break it down a little bit further. They, you might need to learn, they might need to learn to break these standards down further by putting in um, smaller goals in the IEP that give them the baseline tools to, geared towards teaching them these skills. Um, they might not learn these skills by the end of grade four, but they're learning the skills necessary to make as much progress in this area as they can. Um, by the end of grade eight, determine an individual's responsibility for personal actions and contributions to group activities, um, and then use of compromise, consensus, and community building strategies for carrying out different tasks, assignments, and projects. This might not be appropriate for a student who is extremely low functioning like my brother because he's learning to say his name and address, let alone, so he's not learning to compromise and, you know, use, learn community building strategies. Um, so this wouldn't apply, so he would get individual goals, okay, geared towards social skills, but this wouldn't, maybe learning to turn cake, um, but this is it's too advanced for him. Other students who are higher functioning, and this might not be too advanced, but they still might need to learn to break down the steps to learn these skills. That can be done through the IEP process, okay? Through a related service, um, through goals, through um, extra instruction out in, in the classroom, outside of the classroom, you know, wherever it might be necessary that the instruction take place. Um, extra, you put in extra supports, accommodations, um, maybe if they need extended time on something, um, or it's an aid, a one-to-one -one aid, a two-to-one aid, maybe a social skills group, or someone to help them um, take turns. This is, like I said, this is, you can break these skills down so they learn. Um, this is, I'm sorry, the slides are a little bit, are, were switched. Um, it goes, this is all towards um, teaching the students skills to be successful in their career and it, these are and it's important because it will enable them to achieve common goals with greater efficiency um, the, the, the committees have determined as at least in the state of New Jersey have determined that this is an important skill to have if the districts are saying or if your teachers are saying your child is is fine in school well are they able to achieve these goals Okay, they might not be graded on these goals, but it doesn't mean they're doing fine. They might be shy and not initiating. If they're not a behavior problem, that doesn't mean that they don't need that they're that they're fine in school. Okay, they still might need that extra instruction to initiate. Okay, or express their ideas. Um, so that's so that's where I'm going with the core curriculum content standards. They are having difficulty achieving the standard, why are they having difficulty, and what steps do they need to make progress so they can learn these skills, and what supports do they need to make progress to learn those skills. Um, I, like I was talking before, if for, to learn those skills, you might need social skills, confidence, appropriate behaviors, and, and analytical skills. This is what the IEP can, should include. You don't omit these areas. They certainly can include goals beyond the core curriculum content standards. They're supposed to include individualized goals according to the student's unique needs. Um, I know the IEP is developed on a computer-based program, but there's no reason that it has to be limited to those core curriculum content standards. In fact, they're not supposed to be limited to that. 
Um, so, like I said, how will the student learn those skills? Um, special place, special education related services, um, special placement in district or out of district, and measurable goals. Um, and then, so that's that's really the analysis. And then I'll take questions now if you have any. Hillary? Yep. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. It, went, it blanked out for a minute. Uh, were you ready for any questions yet? Yep, I'm ready for questions. Oh, okay, great. Um, so you actually have quite a few questions coming through. Uh, we'll try to get to as many as possible. If your question does not get answered, um, Hillary, if you're comfortable, I will email you those questions um, sure. if you could reach out then. Um, your next question is going to be, my child has executive function issues and problems with pragmatic speech. How can I get specific goals into her IEP, including social skills? Well, you, you go through the evaluation process. Um, if you say your child is having trouble with executive functioning, which is organizational skills or maybe expressive language, um, you, you have to demonstrate that your child is, that it's impacting their ability to learn. Giving, sometimes, and I hate to say this, parents should certainly give extra support in the home, but sometimes um, teachers don't realize that the parents are giving extra support and the child is doing well. So if you're giving extra support in the home or if it's taking your child a long time to complete an assignment, you should certainly make that make the teacher aware of your of your child's difficulties. Um, so to get executive functioning goals or any issues, any difficulties, any pragmatic goals, you would um, identify what your child is having difficulty with. Um, if they if your child is having a conversation and um, the other person that they're having a conversation with walks away and they keep on talking, you know that they need to learn to stop the conversation and, or, um, when somebody walks away or recognize that the individual is bored, et cetera. Um, you can ask for speech and language therapy that would address pragmatics. You can address counseling, maybe a social skills group that addresses um, pragmatics or expressive language. You might get um, instruction, depending for executive functioning, it really depends on how it manifests itself. If you're having, to, if if it's because of learning disabilities um, or ADHD, it, it might be appropriate for your child to get instruction in the resource room environment, um, or you know, which is a smaller group environment. They can get learn the basic skills to organize themselves. Um, they might actually also get an extra set of books so they can bring them to school, uh, so they can have a set of books at home and in school in case they forget them. Um, so, but you would go through the evaluation process. If you disagree with the evaluations, you can get the independent evaluations, or you can get your private evaluation and um, give the district a report with recommendations. Okay, our next question next is, question? Um, my child's statements at present levels of academic achievement and functional performance look like direct quotation from individual evaluations, including the scores. No actual statements to understand how it translates into his needs and supports. Any input? And I, assume, I assume the question is how do you get it to be more, to make it more specific. Um, you first in the IEP meeting you ask the team to expand on the on the present levels of, of educational or academic and functional performance. Um, when you get a draft of the IEP, you can respond to it. If they say no, we're not going to include your concerns um, or these comments in this section, you can say that you want it to be expressed in the parental concerns section, uh, which is a section provided to the parents to express why they believe that the IEP is not completely appropriate for their child. Um, so if it's not, if the team refuses to put it in the present level section, you can certainly incorporate it into the parental concerns section. 
Okay, Hillary, uh, the next question is, when a school does not collect data for IEP goals, is that a denial of FAPE? And is there a case law on this? Uh, it could be a denial of FAPE. It depends on what the, um, it, it really just depends on how the team determined progress would be collected and reported. Um, if for example, your child is supposed to be getting an ABA therapy, and the team is, or the school district is not collecting data. Then I would strongly state that they're being denied FAPE, and you're, there's there's certainly case law on it um, because ABA is applied behavioral analysis. Analysis is collecting data, and if they're not collecting data, they're not completing the analysis, and your child's not getting ABA therapy. So yes, it could. One could certainly argue, and there's case law to support the notion that if you don't collect data, you're not your child is being denied faith. Um, it's not as simple as that. That is a certain, but it's a strong argument to make. Um, if it, you have to show also that your child is not making progress, um, you have to show that not collecting data is interfering with your child's ability to make progress, um, and that's something I can't just openly ask or answer, but I could, I, but if you want, I'll re, I can review reports and things like that to make a better determination. Okay. Um, the next one is, my child has high functioning autism with, I'm sorry, my child with high functioning autism receives a weekly lunch bunch social skills group as a result of being bullied. However, the school will not provide any social skills goals. How can we get her some social skill goals so she can learn to advocate for herself and interact appropriately with her peers? Well, first of all, you would in include in the present levels of academic and functional performance or the parental concern section, you would include that your child has difficulty um, with social skills. It, from a practical standpoint, you don't really, you shouldn't really need to do that because if they have autism, one would say that they have difficulty with social skills, but you should, nevertheless, you should, still should include it in that section. Um, and then uh, you, you, if you want to make a point to the child study team, you would say, look, my child's eligible for an IEP for a reason. Um, they're eligible because as, if they're un eligible under the category of autism, they're most likely eligible because their social skills are interfering with their ability to make progress and therefore they have to include goals to that effect. If they say no and they refuse to address that, then you're, you have the right to challenge the, uh, the IEP through due process proceedings. And Hillary, I know that we're running out of time. Um, like I said, I will definitely, if you're comfortable, um, I will definitely email you the specific questions with um, with a contact, um, either myself or one of our coworkers can send your responses to the families. Um, just to give you one last question, if you're um, if you're okay with that, we have um, a few families are asking if you can give some specific, uh, measurable social skill goal examples. Of course, this is my favorite area. <laughs> um, the one goal would be my child will be able to, will learn to initiate a conversation with a peer without prompting um, three out of five times in the cafeteria. Uh, they will learn to respond to a conversation from an adult or from a peer uh, three out of five times um, with or without prompting, depending on your child's level of, um, of functioning um, in the cafeteria or in a classroom. Um, you can pick the environment that you want. Um, my my child will the student will learn to um, express when they want something by saying I want um, the iPad um, as my brother likes to say on a regular basis um, and and then you can also if you depending on the child you might say that my child will learn to express that what they want without having a tantrum ahead of time. Um, so you can expand if they have behaviors and or if they need prompting, you you could inc incorporate that into the uh, into the goals. 
um, if they, they will learn to take turns. Um, three out of five times when expressing, when in a group activity, um, they will learn to raise their hand in the classroom setting instead of just shouting out the, shouting out the answer or the question. Um, they might learn to, you know, say hello or say goodbye. Um, I have, there, there's this, a really good example where the student was learning to, had a lot of anxiety approaching a group situation on the college campus and the job coach, um, Peter Gerhardt, is, it taught him to say, hey, what's up, and keep on walking. Um, so he didn't have to engage in the conversation with the peers. His anxiety was reduced, but he engaged in a socially appropriate fashion by saying, hey, what's up? Um, so those are some examples of goals. Um, the, uh, you know, so those, those are some examples. In terms of emotional functioning, they, if a child might um, learn to raise their hand and um, and go up to the teacher if they're being picked on or if they if they're anxious. Um, they might learn sometimes teachers will give a cue card to students to express their ideas or express their feelings. So if they can't come up with their feelings, they might refer to the cue card. So a goal might be this, if the student gets anxious, they will refer to the cue card for an example and for to express their ideas. And then, I mean, that's just another example. So I have tons and tons of examples, but those are just, just um, some of them. So I just want to thank every, everybody again for having me present tonight. If you want or have any other questions, feel free to email me. There are also articles on my website at freemanlawoffices.com. Thank you very much. And everyone, please remember to register for Hillary's upcoming IEP review clinic. Um, openings are still available in the Trenton and the Parsippany locations. Please call the Family Support Center of New Jersey. Um, please call the Family Support Center of New Jersey's office. Uh, the number here is 1-800-372-6510 or 732-528-8080 to reserve your session. And on behalf of myself, Hillary Freeman, and my co-workers, Laura Kay and Michelle Tyler. We would like to thank you for joining us for this evening's presentation. Your feedback is important to us, so please look for your evaluation via email within the next 24 hours. Your input will help us determine future topics, so we encourage you to complete this evaluation. This webinar will be archived on the Family Support Center of New Jersey's website. That is fscnj.org. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you.